If you're looking at me and you're thinking, God, she's looking enough, it's been a day. It's 2.43. I have to leave my house at 4.15 to go to my night classes. Um, so I wanted to do still this because this has to be up tonight to be up tomorrow, right? Like it has to be scheduled. It's Tuesday, October 3rd, and this is going up Wednesday, October 4th. Yeah, on a time crunch, we're watching another explain with us i'm gonna watch another explain with us kind of documentary video this one i have no clue what it is it just says hung up and broken grandma and braces teens killer which is quite the title also i will not be making any commentary during this video because i have to get ready and on top of that i don't have my headphones in to listen while I get ready because I feel like that would be a hassle so I'm going to be back in a second my grandson evidently himself last night he's cold he, he, you can't move him the people off behind us watching with binoculars and stuff okay do you know what happened no I don't his head is back his eyes are open. He was murdered. I who? I don't know. Had his head covered. His head was covered? Yeah, he had the blanket up over his, his face. <laughs> What you just heard was the chilling voice of John Apolium calling 911. The grandmother had just found her 14-year-old grandson, Harley Starling, dead in his bed. On, of all days, Halloween morning. As the horrifying details of the case emerge, she learns that this was more than another tragedy, but something far more sinister. It's the night before Halloween 2016 in Springfield, Ohio, and the Starlings are safe at home marathoning a parade of horror movies, such as The Eye and Paranormal Activity. In the room are the Starling brothers, including 16-year-old Nicholas Starling and 14-year-old Harley Starling, along with their grandmother, Jonna, and her boyfriend, Victorino. When the movie marathon is over, the family turns in for the night. But when Jonna wakes up the following morning, she finds Harley's door locked and the boy unresponsive. She calls for him to wake up and unlocks the door, only to find the boy's body is blue and cold to the touch. Did, were there any weapons around or anything? I don't know if he was playing with fake blood or what. There's stuff, there's like the fake blood stuff all over his arm and up around his shoulder. And you said his eyes are open too? Yes. Okay. I shook him because I was trying to wake him up. His dad just died two years ago. Okay. Are there any guns in the house that you know of? Yes, but he, he can't get to them. Okay. Do you live here with them, or how? They live with me. They've lived with me since her dad. And what was... And it was in November. Did you hear anything weird last night or anything? No. Okay. He just went to bed, and that was it. Jonna was certain Harley had taken his own life, but things weren't quite adding up. Investigators quickly got to work questioning those in the home the night of Harley's death. The interrogations begin with John Apulliam, who took custody of the late Harley and his older brother Nicholas two years prior to the incident. Looking back, the boys undoubtedly had a rough upbringing before moving into Jonna's custody. Their father was tragically killed, and their mother was in and out of the home. Jonna sets the scene for detectives, describing the moments that led to her discovering Harley dead in his bed. Um, I left the room at the same time. Okay. I said goodnight, I love you. He said, I love you. I went in my room, he went in his room. Okay. Um, and then you heard Nick up a couple times throughout the night. Yeah, I heard it squeak the door. The door squeak. Yeah. Okay. Because if the cat wants out, he'll go jump on you. Okay. So I got my door shut. They can't jump on me. They can't wake me up. Okay. But they do wake up Nick. Okay, so Nick he'll let them up. Yeah, he'll let them out. Okay. So then you saw him up and then... Um, yeah, that's on the video. And then you woke up again in the morning at 5... When, at five, when I hollered at Nick, and he said, yeah. When I came out, and I asked Nick, and, and Nick was coming out of the bathroom, and he said, yes, I'm going to get him up. And he walked over to the door, and he says, Grandma, the door's locked. Usually it's not locked. So. Okay. So then what happened? So then I went and got the key, okay. and I unlocked the door. Okay. 
she's using a lot of open palm gestures, which can indicate she has nothing to hide. When interpreting what open palms mean in body language, it all depends on the context. It's typical in normal conversation for someone to use a mix of both high confidence, palm down, and low confidence, palm up positions. In this context, Jonna is simply telling her story and is not making any strong declaratory statements. So her frequent and appropriate hand gestures are likely a sign of truthfulness. But nothing out of their routine seemed odd. Is it? No, just to the fact the door was locked. Right. Okay. And he said you noticed his window was open. Yeah, Nicholas noticed his window was open. Nicholas noticed. He that. said his window was open. I said, was it open? I didn't notice. Were his curtains closed or were they open? They they're automatically closed. They're just always closed. The people walk behind us watch in with binoculars and stuff, so I try to always keep curtains up. Okay. There were some weird people. Have you had problems with them in the past? Do no, just they're deep in toms. When you buy 10 tickets on Vivid Seats, you get the 11th ticket free. I wonder what my 11th ticket is. They're just okay. weird. If you got a curtain off, they're looking. Okay. Okay. Now, I, 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 have, I have not been in your house, so I may ask some questions. And you're like, well, yeah, okay. you, you, you have seen probably been the only like, one not in your house yeah. today. Um, <laughs> okay. So you, okay. Said, you said you saw Nicholas on the monitor, so I'm assuming you have two different monitors? No, I have one monitor. It has four, all four cameras on it. Did you see what Nick was doing at all? He was, just went to the door and opened the door. I thought it was my funky neighbor asking for money. Jonna's demeanor is a little more upbeat than one would expect for a grandmother who found their young grandson deceased, but everyone handles grief differently. Reflect back to the 911 call, and you'll notice she was fairly calm then, too. My grandson evidently killed himself last night. She may not want to break down in front of the detectives, so she laughs and makes jokes in order to cope with the loss. Well, there's really no easy way to go about this part. Um, the autopsy... They're still working on it, actually, as we speak, okay? Well, what we do know is that uh, we're not investigating a homicide, or, okay, he didn't hurt himself. The injury that he's sustained could not have been self-inflicted. I have. We, we're not we're entirely not sure, sure yet. We're still trying to piece everything together. Any reason to think that your boyfriend would do something like this? No. How about Nick? I wouldn't believe that Nick would do it either. The possibility. I wouldn't think so. Okay. Notice the immediate and resounding no for the boyfriend. But when she's asked about Nicholas, she uses a qualifier saying, I wouldn't think Nicholas would do it either, indicating that she may be a little uncertain as to his innocence. He was my baby from two weeks old, three weeks old. Okay. How have things been since you got him two years ago? They've had rough in and out, okay. you know, because, you know, their dad lying. And I found out he didn't allow him to have any friends, and Harley was trying to make friends with everybody at school. Sure. Now we hear a strain in Jonna's voice. This is the first time we've audibly heard Jonna express sadness. Remembering what the boys were like when they were younger and the love she felt for them may be triggering her feelings of grief. I went from trying to figure out why he would kill himself to who would kill him and why. Mm -hmm. What would they advance? There's no it advantage make, to it. It doesn't make any sense to us either, okay? So that's why we're trying to figure out what the hell happened, because we don't know. Her grief may be compounded now by feelings of stress or guilt that someone inside the home may have killed Harley. She may be wondering what signs she missed, or if she could have done anything differently to prevent this tragedy. As Jonna's heartbreaking confusion echoes, investigators turn their attention to Harley's older brother, Nicholas. Hi, Nick. How are you? You doing all right? You doing okay? Not really. Well, I understand that. No. Immediately, Nicholas clasps his hands under the table. Interlacing your fingers can be a common way to ease feelings of anxiety or stress. The gesture is an example of an adapter or a method individuals use to comfort themselves. It's comforting because it subconsciously restores a sense of control in what could otherwise be a totally out-of-control situation. And this situation certainly fits the bill. Okay, so when you went to bed, who was all, was anybody else still up? Well, as far as I can tell, everyone was going to sleep. Okay. Well, then, about 11.30. Mm-hmm. 
I got a dog to the mouth. And then later I got back up because I didn't sleep until I got the dogs back in. Okay. After I woke up. Okay, do you leave your door open or closed? Open. Open. Okay. So if anybody else is not moving around or anything like that, you would know that. Great. Mm -hmm. right? Okay. Two to bed. I have kind of a Okay. There's a notably long pause before Nicholas answers about his sleep, and it's not just his slow speech. Throughout the interview so far, Nicholas has presented as someone much younger than he actually is. In one instance, he provided unnecessary and excessive detail given the question asked, indicating that he might have trouble understanding the intended meaning of simple questions. And you two, uh, they're pretty big dogs, aren't they? No, one's a little dog. He's a mixture between a beaver and a basket. Oh, okay. The biggest dog with a clouded eye is a mixture between chocolate Labrador uh -huh. and a pit bull. Okay. okay. In addition to his monotone speech, his speech is also slow. Nicholas seems to struggle with expressing himself verbally. This may explain his slower delivery as he could need time to think about what he wants to say or he may struggle to find the right words. All of these characteristics are typical of individuals with autism spectrum disorder, ASD. We can't make any conclusions about Nicholas's diagnosis based on an interrogation tape, but he displays some behaviors that align with this diagnosis. I go into their boxes, open their cages, walk to my grandma's store. Okay, to your grandma's store. Down to her room, open the back door, then around. Okay. Close it. It's important to note that most individuals with autism spectrum disorder do not commit acts of violence and murder. According to research, it's the presence of other conditions, co-occurring disorders, such as personality disorders, mood disorders, or psychosis, that can contribute to a greater risk of violence among individuals with ASD. Then what, what's next thing you remember? When you signed up for pet insurance, you didn't sign up for... Uh, I'm not going to go into details about my dreams. Your what? My dreams. Okay, I'm not worried about your dreams. Individuals with developmental disabilities often take words, statements, and questions very literally. This can be part of their general struggle with interpreting language and communication. Even though no one asked him, Nicholas wanted to make it clear that he doesn't want to go into details about his dreams. But one thing Nicholas hasn't made clear that his grandmother, Jonna, did is her genuine interest in what actually happened to Harley. She asked detectives for answers again and again. I went from trying to figure out why he would kill himself to who would kill him and why. Mm -hmm. What would they advance? That isn't the case so far with Nicholas, who hasn't asked at all. So after everybody else went to bed, you went to bed, did you actually go to sleep though? After I was done watching the ghost Okay. And once I got over, then I turned it off. I turned the TV off, mm -hmm. went to my bed, and got sleep. Okay. So what time do you think you got to sleep? I think about one something. So you go to bed, and what time do you get up? Well, I got up about five o'clock when I first alarmed this. Okay, 5 a.m. I got to take a shower. And then when I got out of the shower, I got to Harley's door. Okay. I knocked. Okay. I said, Harley, it's time for you to take a bath. He didn't answer. Notice that his tone changes when discussing Harley. Until now, we've heard a mostly monotone Nicholas. But now, just like that, he sounds almost agitated when he speaks Harley's name. Okay. I said, Harley. He's also not frontally aligned with the detective, meaning he isn't facing her directly. This can indicate a person is being deceptive and or feels uncomfortable. It's also part of a behavioral profile for deception, along with being slouched, using barriers, and being unnaturally rigid for long periods of time. Each one alone is not definitively meaningful, but it is when you have other indicators. So when you knocked twice, he didn't answer? No. Okay, and then what happened? Well, after I was done trying to get out, I told Grandma that he wasn't responding. Okay, did you go into his room at any time before you woke Grandma? 
Well, she moves to her key. She finds the key to his bed. She opens it. Tells him, or says it's time for you to get up. Starts to walk away. I tell her that he is not rude for her. She comes in here and keeps it in front. I see it. Window open, I shut it. It's not far open, like about here. As Harley lays unresponsive, it's strange that his brother would be more concerned with shutting the window. Was the blanket um, over his head, not over his head, was it around his waist, was it over his head? This is the kind of detail that investigators could see as a signifier of the perpetrator's emotional attachment to the victim, and is almost never done when the killer doesn't know the victim. How far is your room? It's in his room. About... You're right I'm more than arms up. You share, you share a wall up? I, let's just say this is my walk-in, my bed's all the way up. You walk into his room, it's all the way up. And do you, have a, do you have a window in your room, too? No, no. I keep it. Does he usually sleep with his window open? Nobody doesn't really lock his window. This may be true, but given Jonna's earlier description of the sketchy neighbors... They're peeping toms. Okay. If you got a curtain off, they're looking. It would seem like she would tell them to keep the windows locked. After all, Jonna's surveillance setup shows she's clearly concerned with safety. I have one monitor. It has four, all four cameras on it. Okay. It sits by the bed. But what could this mean? Well, for one, Nicholas is not so covertly trying to convey to the detectives a theory that an intruder came through Harley's window and killed him. It's also possible that this is another example of his difficulty understanding language and communicating. So I guess we're asking permission if we could go into your room. Just, we're not looking for um, anything that may embarrass you. Or, that's not what we're looking for. We're looking for anything that would be connected to this. And if we don't see anything, then we wouldn't take anything. Okay? Is that okay? Okay. What, what would you be concerned about of us going in and finding? I haven't really trusted people that I understand that. Because no one is under arrest for the crime at the moment, searching Nicholas's room without permission could be a potential Fourth Amendment issue. The detective is asking for his permission so she can avoid the delay in needing a warrant, but also to pry for information on just what might be in that room. Notice also that detectives have yet to read Nicholas's Miranda rights, which could come into play later in the case. Do you have any guns or anything like that they need to be aware of? A girl did give us a baseball bat in case anyone tried to break it. Sure. Well, I understand that. Other than that, anything? I mean, is there fear or something you're concerned about or anything like that? No, I just don't want you to be freaked out about the game I have slide The game that has a lot of blood in it? Yeah. Okay. All right. Is it okay when we check your room? What is the most embarrassing thing to happen to you in school? One time that I had to give a presentation in class the night before I was scrambling and trying to... It's a game that has a lot of blood in it. Yeah. Okay. All right. Is it okay when we check your room? Yeah. Okay. Most people are just playing that type of game to stir. Don't be disturbed by my background pictures either. I'm not even going to look at it. Don't you worry about it. I did. <laughs> okay. Or my music. Now, these officers were all about, by me, to take anything, anything they find of evidence or value. Okay, so that means that they find something specific that would be, you know, would have been used in your, your brother's death or something like that. Anything like that that they'll find in there? What? Just the bats. Okay. I know, I forgot. The uh, thing that I... The pants I wore for did the record did, did the batch cause your brother's death? No. Okay. Well then why were it? No. So okay. Okay. Because I didn't hear anyone break my window to get it. Okay. Well that would make sense. Okay? Non-committal answers like, as far as I know, or to the best of my knowledge, can be cues that someone is not being truthful. 
It's less stressful for a deceptive person to give vague responses rather than flat-out lies. The detectives likely already know by the body and crime scene photos if a bat was used in this crime, or at the very least can tell if the victim was hit with a blunt force instrument. By Saturday night, I wore these pants and I got fake blood. Okay. That's easy to say. That's not a big deal. I kind of got mad and just threw away. Okay. He could be getting sweaty palms as he rubs his hands on his knees while discussing his bloody clothing. The same blood he claimed was fake blood. Where are those at? Uh, the long pause he takes is another red flag. He seems to be trying to figure out how to answer this question as the bloody clothes are likely hidden somewhere around the home. I think they're in the trash. Okay. Thank you, Cobra. Okay. Okay. Uh, yeah. I think you might want to fix that hole in the wall. Yeah, we had a guy who got kind of angry at us and broke our wall. Also strange is Nicholas's concern with the hole in the wall. With the detectives gone, he actually takes a moment to walk across the room and inspect the wall up close. Mesmerized by the flaw. Given the circumstance, most people would be solely focused on the murder of their brother to the point of possibly not noticing such a detail or not caring enough to mention it. Bringing it up may be a way to alleviate his own feelings of anxiety as it's a distraction from the intensity of the questioning. He likely feels very out of control in the police interrogation room, and identifying this flaw may give him a brief feeling of confidence. Meanwhile, in another room, detectives have allowed John Apolium and another family member to sit together and talk. He was murdered. By who? I don't know. I kind of figured he was murdered because John nothing was making sense. They couldn't find a gun. They had to have a murder weapon. How could he be there? The fact that this conversation is allowed to happen means detectives have already cleared both of them as suspects. The detectives will also want to see if they can learn anything useful by recording them discussing the crime and the boys. Jana is visibly distraught and shows a lot of emotion through her words, tone, and body language. In comparison, her relative appears less emotional and is looking at the situation logically, which is how some people handle stress. She may also be trying to stay strong for Jana and offer her support. I told Nicholas we may be moving somewhere else because I don't know that I can take coming in and seeing Harley every day. While this conversation continues, over in the other room, Nicholas is waiting for another round of interrogation. But he barely moves as he waits for the detectives to return after almost an entire hour, all the while showing what seems to be a complete lack of anxiety. But everything isn't always as it appears. Sometimes what looks like a lack of empathy and indifference could be due to his inability to recognize, manage, and understand his own feelings because of his potential developmental disability. Hey, Nicholas. Can you remember me? I'm the general Jordan. Who spoke out there? Uh, yeah. Did you miss trick or treat yesterday? Mm -hmm. Or on yeah. Saturday? Saturday it was for the entry. Interestingly, the detective is in a closed stance as well. You can see his arms in front of his body interlocked in a barrier position. Typically, detectives trying to push towards an honest confession would be in a very different body position, leaning forward with their elbows on their knees, like the other officer. Your brother. Uh What was, his, what was he like yesterday? Like, he was all right. What was it? Okay. I think he was down. We want to ask you some more questions, more in detail about some of the things that happened yesterday, okay? Okay. Before I do, I'm going to invite you to rise, okay? All right. Once I'm finished reading this, if you have any questions, just let me know, all right? The detectives Mirandize Nicholas as they're about to turn the heat up and confront him about his previous statements. They will begin to ask him tougher, more direct, and accusatory questions to finally uncover the truth about what happened to Harley. Notice also he hasn't been Mirandized till now, later in the interview process. 
In the beginning, Nicholas wasn't given Miranda warnings, but it's considered undisputed that he made no inculpatory statements in that window, and he did consent to detectives searching his bedroom and cell phone after all. She had her hand out and you're watching movies. Everything good. You guys get along okay yesterday? You're not upset with each other? Did you guys get in a fight about anything? We didn't really have much. Were you mad at each other? No, but uh, yeah. Yeah. Well, you guys argue about? Yeah. 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 It's very different than what I'm used to. Shooting the show in France gives us a lot of opportunities to do things that we... Who could get the last few stuff chopping from this gun? Mm -hmm. And also stuff like, which might not be consistent with the other person. You say you were upset with each other over just a candy thing at first? It was bad for us to well, did you guys argue about it? A little bit. Why did he get more candy than you did? No, our grandma just gave us one of these uh, boxes to have the uh, white and marshy, yeah, marshy materials in it. <laughs> did he eat the majority of those? Yeah, he ate the majority of them. Our grandma gave us a share. She gave two to share, but he ate all of them. No, so I ate two, he ate three. The last one was the one he had in his hand. So I ate the one. And then the last one he ate one. No, the Okay, but, where, I mean, you just didn't want him to have it? I mean, why did you guys argue? What was said when you were arguing? Not much. Nicholas's response is vague and evasive. He may not want to admit how serious the argument was, as that could portray him in a negative light. The detectives want to see if things might have escalated into something more, as this seems too minor to have motivated Nicholas's anger. Where do you let the cat out? Mm -hmm. the cat out of the front door. The front door. Uh, do you ever, do you keep the cat in your room at night? The, your bedroom at night, or do they just roam through the house? They just roam through the house. Okay. I'm trying to string around the cat. I'm just curious why a cat has a string around his neck. Did you do that? No. Who did? I don't know. You don't want to get in shoot at? Did Mittens have a string around his neck when you let her outside? No, she didn't. She didn't? Okay. Or do you usually stay up late? Do you go to sleep quickly or do you stay up late? The only days I ever stay up late is when I'm dead. When I'm sad. When you're sad? When you sad last night? Yeah, but I got over it. <laughs> what were you sad about? Do you mind telling me? I was hanging in the game close to November. And that's the uh, one that's going to A mention of being sad and staying up late could mean Nicholas struggles with sleep disturbances when he's sad. His father's death may have triggered issues, possibly with depression, grief, and loss. Nicholas? Yeah. Obviously, you know what happened to your brother, right? Well, he's, he's no longer here. We're trying to figure out what happened to your brother, okay? I think you may know some things that may help us here. The detectives really start to key in here and begin the first step in the process of the read technique, a positive confrontation. The detective is going about this less aggressively than is normally seen because Nicholas is young and he doesn't want to be seen as coercive or too aggressive with him. Detectives have to be extra careful when using the read technique on minors or people with mental illness or disabilities to avoid any accusations of being coercive. Nicholas may qualify as someone who's more vulnerable given his age and possible cognitive delays. We need you to be honest with us about some things. Like what? Well, about what might have happened there last night. Through a great deal of this intense questioning, Nicholas makes unwavering eye contact and remains very still as the detective questions his story. While many people mistakenly think that sustained eye contact is a sign of honesty, it's normal for eyes to move around a bit when talking. Sustained eye contact is actually a red flag for deception as they're trying to check and see if they're believed. This level of sustained eye contact isn't typical for an individual on the spectrum, as this would usually be notably stressful for someone with ASD. This may cast some doubt on that possible diagnosis. Now, you know that uh, your grandmother has surveillance, right? Right. Mm -hmm. well, 
viewing that as we speak. Is the story that you're giving me going to line up with what we see in that video? Or are there some, are there some other things that maybe we should know? This is what is known as the bait question in the read technique. If someone is being honest, they'll likely provide a strong denial at this point. But someone who's being deceptive may answer vaguely. Did you ever go outside for anything last night? No. Never. What if I told you we found a ball bat? Not behind the house. Why can't you hear this? Before the interview began, officers were spotted by a local news crew collecting a baseball bat from the side of the home. Do you want to explain to me why that might be there? I could exactly tell why a ball bat would be there. Did you put it there? Yeah. Did you put it there? Yes. We found some jeans which is below it. In their house. Were those your jeans? Yeah. Did you change your pants last night? Yeah. Did someone along your room? Yeah. You'll remember Nicholas previously stated that he had pants with fake blood on them. You were upset with your brother. You guys got into it. I understand that brother's fight. I used to fight with my brother all the time. You're not being completely honest with me. Yes, I am. I don't think that you are. You might be in there real bad. You beat his head. I was very, very angry. The crick split over the skull. Nicholas appears to be indifferent and doesn't show any visible distress at hearing that his brother's head was beat in. While it's possible that he has difficulty expressing feelings the way the average person would, this response can be seen as a red flag that he's trying to hide or control his reaction to this news. Like what on that video you was talking about when you buy 10 tickets on Vivid Seats, you get the 11th ticket free. I wonder what my 11th will be. I don't like what happens on that video you were talking about How um, this happened to me. like what happened on that video. Awesome videos up. These gender blocks, all kinds of stuff. This is what is called a resume response. In this case, making a broad statement about his character instead of really answering the detective's question. Another red flag. Also note the sudden change in his tone. It's an unexpected twist that Nicholas starts asking the other detective questions about the video game. Because until this point... Nicholas presents as naive, innocent, childlike, and compliant. Now, though, he's being rather bold as he challenges the detective's comments. Nicholas, I can tell you're not being honest. Everything about you and your body language tells us that you're not being honest. You're sure there's a bad job. Okay? Hey. We just want to know the truth about what happened so we can solve this for your grand and your family. Okay? They can't say, probably, but they can't get into the hood, have a string around his neck. That's that because I found out she, she did some of this stuff under my desk, like my games. Just 10 minutes earlier, Nicholas denied the incident with the cat. Who did that? I mean, you're not in trouble if you're tired. I'm just curious why a cat had a string around his neck. Did you do that? No. Who did? But why confess? Why change directions now? It's possible Nicholas changed his story in the hopes this lie will explain why the detectives are sensing he's not being honest and will somehow explain his inconsistencies. Animal abuse is obviously a huge red flag of serious conduct issues among children and teens. Sometimes if this behavior is recognized early enough, and the child receives help, it can possibly prevent tragedy later on. It's also a possibility that Nicholas developed issues with anger and sadness after the death of his father, and then began displaying behaviors like cruelty to animals. But you understand that in watching that video, you're the only one moving around that house. Nobody else is there. This is what I think. You want to know my opinion? What? I think you went in there, you were pissed at him and killed him, and then you went back and forth between the bathroom, cleaned yourself up and changed your clothes. Those bloody pants we found, for years you were wearing them, and then wearing them, that's got your brother's blood on it, and you took them off so the light was find it. By not moving and closing himself off, Nicholas may be hoping that he can avoid calling any more attention to himself, and his positioning shows he likely feels defeated. 
knowing his lies and cover-up aren't enough. But, I want to ask you this question, why? What would make you so mad? What do you do that would make you so mad that you want to do that? I didn't tell him. They did We can't help you if you don't help us. Because if you don't tell us, then we'll never have the true story. But I know that you did. You did that to me. But why did you do it to me? Yes, you always did. I was a true story, correct? I was a big sucker. By admitting that Harley was asleep when he hit him with a bat, any possible self-defense claim is removed from the equation. Did you just stab him with something in the neck? Well, that time then, he's been starving. Were you trying to help him die faster so he would suck him? I'm trying to make him be quiet. The detective offers Nicholas the justification that he might have stabbed Harley to put his brother out of his misery. This is another part of the Reed technique gradually increasing the suspect's comfort while not unveiling what really happened. How many times did you say? I think about two or three times. Two or three times. Did you hit him in the head with that ball back 14 or 15 times? Yeah. And then you went outside, which didn't matter. Eight. Just dropped everything. Well, you said you were going to go outside. Did you walk out your mom or your grandmother's bedroom and then sit there with the fence or did you go to the front door? I got out of school. He climbed out of school. Was that why the window was open? Mm-hmm. Yes. Did you lock his bedroom door when you leave that open? Yes. Did, did, did you go to your room and go to sleep, or have you slept at all? I got out of school. Remember what I was saying before, how sometimes we do. We all do things, and we don't take time to think about it, and we record it, and it's over with. Yeah. Were you just that bad at it? Or some of the stuff that you're done to you? You think that watching those video games can get you to do something like that? Did it make you angry playing those games, listening to that music? And that? No. You were just mad at your brother. It's hard to imagine someone being able to sleep after committing such a gruesome crime against their own brother, whose dead body is also sitting in the adjacent room. But if Nicholas has no history of violence, it's likely that there was more going on aside from him being just mad. You were kind of upset you got in there? Yes. How long did you stay in there before you decided to grab the bat and hit him? About uh, two minutes. You stayed in there watching him? Yeah. It's possible that Nicholas may have felt very powerful watching Harley lay defenseless in his bed. His confidence may have built up the longer he stood in his brother's room, realizing he had the power now and Harley's life was in his hands. Premeditation and or lying in wait is one of the elements that can be used to charge someone with first-degree murder. You did a lot of walking around there after your mom or your grandmother went to bed. You guys were told to go to bed even before you let the dogs out. You're doing a lot of walking around there. What were you doing? Were you... Were you thinking about doing something then? We just wait for them to go to sleep? How did you plan on hurting them a little? What were you going to do? I was going to As the confession develops, officers shift focus on clarifying the whereabouts of all the weapons involved. Hey, we were uh, trying to figure out the night, okay? Because you told me that um, after you stabbed me, you went into the bathroom and you washed the knife off, right? Okay. So then you come back and you said after you cleaned it off, did you put it did you put it back in here or did you go take it and put it directly into your bag? The story comes out clearly, and detectives have most of what they need. Okay, we're working on paperwork right now. Right. We're gonna be under arrest after this. And we take you over to jail. We need fingerprints and photos. It was like a TLT meeting. And then we're going to take over to the juvenile hall. 
Now, just talk to your grandmother. Or should we just talk to your grandmother and granny? They're not, they're not mad. To her. Okay. To her for a number of reasons right now. So we'll see. Are you okay with that? Yes. Well, it's completely up to you. Okay? If you don't want to see them, we'll tell them that. If you want to see them, then we'll tell them that. You're okay with seeing them? Oh, yes. Okay. As he is once again fidgeting with his hands, likely an effort to reduce his feelings of stress, Nicholas may not have considered what his family was going through as he has been so focused on himself. I don't know what to do for you. I'm going to do what I can. I don't know why you have an extra brother. She called me back. It was. I don't know what to do. A somber and tragic scene unfolds as Nicholas gets the opportunity to see his family. It's likely the detectives are allowing Nicholas to see his family for his family's benefit, not necessarily for him. The police will try to accommodate the victims if they can, especially when they endured such a horrible tragedy. It's clear by the way Jonna comforts her grandson that she loves him despite his horrific actions. She's been put into a very difficult situation, yet she's demonstrating a lot of strength in her willingness to stand by Nicholas. <laughs> this is his first show of emotion, possibly because seeing and hugging his family has allowed reality to sink in. The staff brings him some food, but when he starts to open the bag, he breaks down. <laughs> <laughs> Not only is reality sinking in, but now it seems it's crashing down on his shoulders. Oftentimes, murder suspects will break down emotionally when they're handed consequences, when they know they'll be suffering. In this case, Nicholas broke down emotionally at seeing his family, which is an indication that it's not the consequences he's upset about, but understanding the reality of what he's done and how it's affecting others. Still, the consequences would turn out to be severe. At first, when Nicholas received charges of aggravated murder and tampering with evidence, he pleaded not guilty by reason of insanity. Defense lawyers also initially argued his case should be dismissed as a result of his young age. But ultimately, the case was moved from juvenile court to adult court, the judge made the move as a result of the severity of the crime. Prosecutors called the case the worst involving child-on-child -child crime they had ever seen. Although the Halloween candy mentioned in the interrogation tape seemed to be the core of the argument that sparked the chilling crime, police never did find a clear motive. At 17, Nicholas Starling changed his plea to guilty. He was convicted of killing his brother and was sentenced to 15 years to life in prison. This is a more recent look at Nicholas, years after his sentencing. He'll have to wait until 2031 for a chance of parole, but until then, he'll continue to live out his days behind bars at the Lebanon Correctional Institution in Lebanon, Ohio. Do I feel bad? Yes. Do I feel bad for him? No. I think animal cruelty is fun and soft icky, and then killing someone is double icky. So, like, he made his bed, he lay in it. I hope you enjoyed getting nutty with me and watching this. I will see you on Monday with a vlog. Yeah.